In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you, thank you, bless you, honor you, glorify your name. Thank you, Father, for giving us once again a beautiful day. Thank you, Father, for uniting us together as one family in this class. Though we are in different parts of the world, through this technology, you enable us to gather together in one classroom, although we can't meet each other personally, but we can fellowship with one another through this technology. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity you give us each day to fellowship with the Holy Spirit and to fellowship with one another. Today, once again, Spirit of God, as you teach us, take complete control of this class, take complete control of all my faculties, my heart, my mind, my lips, my vocal cords. Nothing of me, everything of you. And Lord, as you teach us, make this teaching absolutely easy. Make it practical for us. So that applying each day what we learn, we can live the victorious life that Jesus has ordained for us. We thank you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. So once again, a warm welcome to you, my sisters and brothers. Our gospel passage today is from Luke chapter 7 verses 35 to 35. We've just got about four verses. But before I go to verse number 31 to 35, let me give you a little recap of what we missed in the earlier part of Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, before this uh, verses 31 to 35, Jesus has been honoring John the Baptist. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus, in fact, when he's telling the crowd, He's telling them that until that time, John the Baptist is the greatest ever prophet who walked on this earth. John the Baptist was the greatest ever prophet who walked on this earth. Even Jesus went on to say, of all men or all those who are born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest of all times. Imagine the honor that he gives. First and foremost, John the Baptist was Jesus's first cousin. He was Elizabeth, was Mary's uh, sister, her son. And he was born to Elizabeth at a very old age. And he was born and his birth was a miracle. As much as Jesus's birth was also a miracle because Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And there was just about six months difference between John the Baptist and Jesus. So it was quite possible that John the Baptist and Jesus as little boys must have played together. They must have gone to each other's house. They must have been cousins. They would have known each other. And yet the same man, John the Baptist is being honored by Jesus because John the Baptist understood his calling. Remember my brothers and sisters, each and every one who walks on this earth has a special calling. God doesn't make any junk. God has not put us on this earth just to, you know, get up each morning, go to work, come back and go to sleep, then get up again and do the same thing. There is a purpose for which God has made us. John the Baptist had done such a great revival in the whole of Israel because he had been preaching with such power and such truthfulness that he had brought a major revival the whole of Israel and he had prepared the nation of Israel. Jesus honors John the Baptist as the greatest prophet as I told you and the important thing that Jesus was highlighting in verse number 31 was that as the message is greater the condemnation for those who reject that message will also be great remember John the Baptist had actually been prophesied to be the prophet who would actually prepare the ways of Jesus. If you read the book of Malachi, the last uh, prophet who actually had prepared, you know, all the Old Testament, uh, you know, the Old Testament, uh, which has been written, Malachi is the last chapter in the Old Testament. And he was the prophet who was actually prophesying even the arrival of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist had done a fantastic job. And here in this verse, Jesus was showing the people then and also to each one of us, even today, that when we hear the word of God and we do not repent and receive Jesus, our judgment is going to be very severe. Remember, my brothers and sisters, this is the time 
of God's mercy. This is the time of God's grace. We are in the, in the, in, in the season of grace. We are in the season of God's mercy. When Jesus came the first time on the earth, he came as that little babe in Bethlehem and he came as the Prince of Peace. He came with his mercy and grace. But there is a time when Jesus will come again, where he will not come with mercy and grace, but he'll be coming as the righteous judge. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to understand that this is the time where we can receive the mercy of God. We can receive the grace of God. And now, because of God's mercy and grace, which is freely available, we should take every opportunity. We should be able to appropriate every grace and every uh, mercy of God. And the word of God says in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. If we, we'll just read that. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. It says, grace and peace is multiplied through the knowledge of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Many times, brothers and sisters, we want the grace of God. We want the mercy of God and we pray for mercy of God. We pray for the grace of God. But let us read 2 Peter chapter 1. Let us read that and see how you and I can receive the grace of God. We can receive the mercy of God. May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied, the writer says. Through the, through the knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So whenever we want the grace of God, we need to know the word of God. We need to know God's word. And we need to know experience his love. Brothers and sisters, many a times we are praying for the grace of God. We are praying for the mercy of God. But the word of God is the grace of God. And so when we know the word, just not at head knowledge, just, just being hearers of the word. When we hear the word of God and we put that word into action, now the grace of God is at work and that grace of God takes us to our victory. The grace of God allows us to receive God's mercy. The grace of God takes us to our destination. The word of God allows us to fulfill the purpose for which God has put us in this life. And so brothers and sisters, if you and I need to receive the grace of God, the mercy of God, first and foremost, we need to invest time to study the word, not just read our Bibles, not just read it like a newspaper or like a story. We need to study the word, just like you know, students study the, the, uh, their, their studies for the examination. If you ask a student today, have you studied? They will not say we just read the book and we are going to go and answer exam. They will have studied the book. They will have referred to other books. They would have learned the formula. They would have understood what they have studied so that when the examination comes, they will be able to answer the exam. In the same way, brothers and sisters, when we take the word of God, when we study the word of God, when we reflect on the word of God and we do what the word says, the test of life does not come announced. The test of life does not, the, the, the enemy is not going to say, Tomorrow at five o'clock in the morning or tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning is going to be your test. The test comes suddenly and we must be prepared for the test of life. And that is why when we study the word of God, when we keep doing the word of God every day of our life, we apply the word of God every single moment of our life. We are in the grace of God. We receive the mercy of God and we are heading surely but straight to that mission and to finish that goal for which God has put us. And in this verse, verse number 31, Jesus is comparing those who receive him with those who live a life filled with God's wisdom and God's direction. Remember my brothers and sisters, unless we take the word of God, unless we apply the word of God, we will never be able to fulfill our God-given destiny. We will never be able to fulfill our God-given uh, you know, mission. And many a times we are inclined to do our own thing. Maybe it's because of our education, because of our experience, because, you know, we are grown up with so many years of experience. We just feel we know it. But, you know, brothers and sisters, when we take the word of God, we study the word of God, we allow the spirit of God to direct us. The spirit of God will always direct us to the path of fulfilling our mission here on earth. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Those people who receive him are actually the ones who are going to have the fulfillment of their mission, fulfillment of that goal, just like John the Baptist did, just like Jesus 
did, and they did their mission with flying colors. Verse number 32. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. Now, brothers and sisters, in verse number 32, Jesus is comparing about children in the marketplace. He says, there are some who are playing very good music, dancing music, but people are not dancing. There are some who are playing, you know, very sad music and nobody is even showing any emotions. And why was he saying this? Why was he giving this particular example? This example of Jesus was speaking of himself and John the Baptist. Now listen to this, my brothers and sisters. John the Baptist lived a life totally separated from the world's pleasures and from the world's comforts. In fact, the word of God says in Matthew chapter 3 verse 4. Let us read Matthew chapter 3 verse 4. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Imagine brothers and sisters, John the Baptist used to wear camel's skin as his clothes. Now, I don't know how comfortable or how uncomfortable is camel skin, but I can tell you it's definitely not as comfortable as the shirt that I'm wearing right now or the clothes that you are wearing right now. Now, brothers and sisters, someone wearing camel skin as their clothes and having locust and wild honey only goes to show you that this man is definitely not having the comforts of life. He's not enjoying the pleasures of life. And where was he all this time? John the Baptist used to live in the wilderness. And from the wilderness, where he began to study the word of God, where he began to get inspired by what his mission was, he began to preach the word of God. It's so courageously, such a strong message that the whole nation of Israel began to receive him. There were people who were going into the wilderness to hear John the Baptist preach. They were, John the Baptist wasn't coming to the city. John the Baptist was not coming into Jerusalem. John the Baptist was not coming into the synagogues. John the Baptist was not coming to homes. He was preaching in the wilderness where it was so uncomfortable. Probably, you know, there may have been grass around. There may have been insects around. There must have been most, un, uh, you know, most inhabitable place where John the Baptist lived. And yet, John the Baptist preached a gospel or preached a message which was so strong that even he preached against Herod, who was the ruler at that time. You know, brothers and sisters, Herod had actually married the wife of his brother Philip Herodias. And what did John the Baptist say when he was preaching in the wilderness? He told Herod that what he had done was wrong. Can you imagine if those scribes, those Pharisees or some spies came there to hear what John the Baptist was saying? Surely the message must have reached the Herod's palace. And eventually Herod had John the Baptist arrested. And for the very reason he spoke against the ruler, he gave him the right message. He told him that what he was doing was wrong. The very reason he spoke brought about the death of John the Baptist. You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus was contrasting in this verse 32 here to the life that John lived and he lived and yet doing what God had called both of them to do. And they both did it absolutely well. They ended up doing it with exceptional perfection. Brothers and sisters, when we begin to understand, listen to this very carefully. When we begin to understand what our mission is, what our calling is. Many a times we begin to think that we got a, we finished our education, we applied for a job, we got a job, we, we stayed on that job. Sometimes after working for a particular amount of time, we have lost complete interest in the job, but we can, and months have become years, years have become years, have reached us to such an extent that we just go through the motions of life. And you know, brothers and sisters, God has not called us to go through the motions of life. He did not call Moses after he was 40 years only to go and live in the palace and just live his life in luxury. God had to stir up his nest and Moses had to run into the desert. And when he ran into the desert, he got married to Jethro's daughter. He became Jethro's father-in-law. He began to look after the sheep. For 40 years, he began to work in the wilderness, cleaning the sheep, taking the sheep as to, uh, to pasture. 
and it was during this time he encountered the Lord who trained him all those 40 years in the desert to now go and lead the people of Israel to the promised land. Brothers and sisters, what happened to David? David also was a shepherd boy. He was looking after the sheep. Although the prophet Samuel came to anoint the sons of Jesse, even though David was not in that first lineup when Jesse had put all his sons, it was God who pulled David out from, the, from looking after the sheep and anointed him king of Israel. And he never became king of Israel the moment he was anointed. For 13 long years, even the king who was at that time Saul chased David. He was after his blood he, till eventually all that training that he got helped him to become such a great one heart. Remember my brothers and sisters, if today you think that you have just been having a life which is monotonous, a life which is not exciting, a life where you have still not found the, the, the purpose and the, and the plan of God in your life, the important answer that I can give you today is take the word of God, start studying the word of God. Don't expect answers, instant answers. Allow the word of God to speak to you and surely the Lord is going to lead you to that spot, to that mission, to that particular task, to that assignment where you will be able to enjoy yourself and begin to feel that fulfillment which only God has put you and me on this planet earth. Brothers and sisters, I can share you from my own personal experience that until you find where God has put you, where he's led you, where he wants you to be, you will never experience that joy, that peace. You will experience a lot of luxury probably on this earth because you will have a good salary. You will probably experience, you know, the, the pleasures of life because you have got some money. But I can tell you one thing, at the end of it, there will be still hollowness, there'll be still emptiness. It's only when we take the word of God, when we study the word of God, when we understand that God has a mission for you and me, then only we shall be able to fulfill that mission and fulfill that purpose in our life. Verse number 33. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. Now, brothers and sisters, John the Baptist lived a very secluded life. He never lived in the, in the city. He lived a very secluded life. He was separated from the world's pleasures. He was separated from the luxuries of this world. As I just mentioned to you, he lived a life of seclusion. He lived on a, on a, on a diet of, you know, honey, wild honey. And he, he just lived in the wilderness wearing camel skin. Probably he must have slept there with the, with the dew on his head, with the heat of the sun. We don't know what sort of comfort he went through. He was a man who was away from society, living in self-quarantine, just like there are people right now in this pandemic who are also put in self-quarantine. Some of them are in quarantine by force because they have, been, they have got the virus. Some of the people have self-quarantined themselves. They don't want to meet anybody of fear of getting the virus. And so brothers and sisters, here John the Baptist was someone who never lived with society. He was not a person who interacted with everybody. He was a person who was totally secluded. So what would have been the reaction of the people? People thought, especially the Pharisees, the scribes, and all those religious leaders at that time, because of the impact that John the Baptist had done, he began to think that John the Baptist had a demon. He was demon-possessed. And instead of encouraging him, encouraging the people, going and hearing what the message of John the Baptist was, realizing that John the Baptist was preaching and preparing the people of Israel for the coming of Christ, these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, began to reject John the Baptist. They began to discourage people and they did not even take the message of John the Baptist. On the contrary, they began to make false accusations against John the Baptist. Remember, my brothers and sisters, when you are called to do what God has called you to do, remember this very clearly. When you are called to do what God has called you to do, you will experience a lot of persecution. You need to ask yourself, if every day in my life, am I experiencing any persecution? Am I experiencing any trouble? Am I experiencing any challenges? Or is everything just so smooth? Is my life so mediocre? Is it just making no significance? Because only those 
who are going to make a significance in their life, only those who are going to really do what the Lord has called them to do, they shall be persecuted. People will come against them. People will reject them. People will persecute them. People will even kill them. But remember, my brothers and sisters, the word of God says that only those who live a godly life will be persecuted. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says so persecution is the birthright of every single believer of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know my brothers and sisters, John was the man who was so courageous that he which he did and even eventually lost his life and so brothers and sisters when you and I are going to be in the truth of the word if you and I are going to study the word and start living the word every day of our life there is no doubt that you and I are going to face persecution we are going to face rejection people are going to speak against us people are going to come against us because we are going against the current remember when you are operating according to the kingdom of God when you are operating according to God's word you are against the tide you're against the flow of the word because the word and the world are in two different directions let me say this again the direction of the world is of legend is a life of easy, easy going, is a life of pleasure, is a life where, you know, of purity, of, of sin, of so much of, you know, wickedness. But the word of God is actually asking us to live a righteous life. The word of God is challenging us to think according to God's word. And so the world's way and the world's way actually are opposing each other, resulting in the people who operate according to the word of God coming against the people of this world and facing persecution, facing anger, rejection, even facing suffering. So brothers and sisters, when you begin to experience persecution, when you begin to experience rejection, when you begin to experience all that trouble and suffering because of your faith in Christ, the word of God says, blessed are you because you are making an impact in the kingdom of God. You are making inroad in the kingdom of darkness. And it was John the Baptist who was preparing the people of Israel for the coming of Christ. It was Jesus who was going out and telling them that what they were doing was absolutely wrong. He was giving them God's mercy. He was showing them God's love. He was giving them God's grace. And people were rejecting even the Son of God. So brothers and sisters, when you and I today who have been given the marching orders by Jesus, where did he say that? In Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20, Jesus said, go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. Tell everybody that Jesus is alive. Tell them he's not a dead God. He's an alive. He's a God who's living in each one of us. And brothers and sisters, we don't need to always go on the pulpit. We don't need to take the Bible with us and start quoting scriptures when we have to proclaim the word of God. We can simply offer somebody else our own testimony of how through living the word of God, how by studying the word of God, how by actually doing the word of God every day of our life, how we are living a victorious life, how we are living a life where we are becoming overcomers of everything that is being thrown at us. And brothers and sisters, when you and I are able to live a life according to the word of God, we surely will be tested. We will have testimonies because we are going to stand firmly by the word of God. And when we do that and we share that with so many other people, we are going to bring them also into the pulpit and preach the word of God. Not everybody is called to go and start you know, sharing the word of God as, as it stands in the Bible. But we can share our own testimonies. We can share what the Lord is doing personally in our life and do our part in being the people that God has called us to do. Bearers of good news, heralds of the gospel and bringing good tidings to everyone we meet. Verse number 34. <coughs> the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a blood collectors and sinners. Now, brothers and sisters, Jesus had spoken to the people in Matthew chapter 11 verse 15 as referring to the truth in this same verse. What did he say in Matthew chapter 11 verse 15? Let us read that. 
Let anyone with ears listen. He says, let anyone with ears listen. I mean, brothers and sisters, during the time of Jesus, it's not that people were, you know, without ears. Only the, because the word of God says, only those who have ears, let them listen. Do you think that in the congregation of there were people who were without ears? Absolutely not. What was he talking about? He was talking about the people who had that spiritual perception in order to hear the word of God. Because many people had become spiritually dull. They were so focused on mechanically doing the things. The law had made people so mechanical, so sterile, that they just went on doing the things. Like how many people even today are really doing like the law. You know, we just go about, you know, go to church, we just do our own thing, we kneel down, we pray, we do so many rosaries, we do so much of fasting, we just carry out so much of spiritual exercises, just hoping that something God will do. When we begin to understand that it is by believing in what Jesus has done, that we can receive every good thing from the kingdom of God understand that Jesus has salvation and all he wants is you and I to believe his word and receive the victory that he has already obtained for us and you know my brothers and sisters when we begin to understand that Jesus has already finished for us we live in the era of the Holy Spirit we live in the era of the post resurrection how much more for us who have been given the Holy Spirit can you imagine Imagine, brothers and sisters, Jesus said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. I am with you, I am in you till the end of time. And if we understand this truth, that the Holy Spirit is never going from away from us on a vacation. The Holy Spirit never leaves us. The Holy Spirit has taken permanent residence inside of us the day we receive Christ. And brothers and sisters, this verse, Jesus was saying that those who walk in the wisdom of God will be to understand and know that's exactly what Jesus is saying he was telling those people that John have a devil inside of him and that he was not a glutton he was not a drunkard Jesus was just interacting with the people Jesus was just having fellowship with the people he was letting people know that he was a friend of sinners that's what he himself said I have not come for the righteous. He said, require a doctor. That's what Jesus said. And many a times, Pharisees and scribes thought that they were very good people. They were holy people. They did not require God because what they did was absolutely perfect. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we come to a stage where we begin to understand our helplessness without Christ, when we begin to understand our inadequacy without the word of God, when we begin to us understand our insufficiency without God in our life, that's the best position to be. And that is what is called as being poor in spirit. Because now we are going to depend on God and his word for every single thing in our life. And that's what Jesus was telling in this verse number 34. He was saying, John the Baptist was not having a demon in him. That's what the people thought. He had not been, a, he was not a drunkard and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a glutton, although he was interacting with all the sinners and drinking with them. He was only fellowshipping with them. He wanted to them to feel that God is a God who loves every single person. And brothers and sisters, many a times we are biased. We begin to, you know, not fellowship with people. We are only with people suited and booted and well-dressed and we will have fellowship with only those people but God has made no difference God is the one who will interact with everyone God is the one who has no favorites no partiality he is out there to reach every single person and so brothers and sisters when we trust the Lord when we put our trust in him God is faithful to us and when we understand that those who twist the truth of God God's word they are actually people who have no spiritual perception. People who twist the truth are the people who do not have spiritual perception. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what the scribes did. That's what the religious leaders during the time of Jesus did. And brothers and sisters, when we understand that only those who have been given the Holy Spirit, those who have accepted Christ, they only will be the ones who will understand spiritual truths. Let us read once again. Matt, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. 
those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's spirit for their foolishness to them and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The word of God says that those who are unspiritual cannot receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not receive. They just cannot receive because those gifts have to be received spiritually. Remember my brothers and sisters, spiritual things can only be discerned by those who have the Holy Spirit in them. And we who have received Christ have received with Christ the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. But are we really asking the Holy Spirit? Are we really talking to the Holy Spirit? Are we taking the word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us the word and make the word simple for us? Today, brothers and sisters, is the day for us to understand that it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can receive all the gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give us. And what is one of the greatest gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us is the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge. Remember, my brothers and sisters, it is impossible with our human mind to read the word of God. It is impossible with our human mind, with all our degrees, with all our university, with all our PhD, to be able to understand God's word. But when we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the understanding of the word. He is the one who makes spiritual truth so easy. He makes the, spirit, the word of God so simple and practical for us to understand that now with that understanding, with that practical working knowledge, we can do the word of God. We can obey the word of God. We can apply the word of God in our day-to-day -day life and receive the victory. So in this next verse that we are going to read in verse number 35, we are going to talk about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that is the gift of wisdom. Let us read verse number 35. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. The word of God says, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. You know, brothers and sisters, wisdom is justified by her children. And that's what it says in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Can we read that? Proverbs chapter 9 verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge is what is the Holy One. The Holy One gives us the knowledge. It's all part and package of that wisdom. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this verse in chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, the Word of God gives us a further insight about what wisdom really is. Because we must understand, without the wisdom of God, it is impossible for us to operate in godly ways. It is only by understanding godly wisdom, by getting it through the word of God, that now we can operate according to God's wisdom. Let us read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who set and get understanding. Her, for her income is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. So as we read this verses in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, we see that when somebody has the wisdom of God, it says, still know the story of Solomon. Solomon was chosen as the king of Israel after his father David. And he was a very young boy when God chose him to be the king of Israel. And one night, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and he asked him, Solomon, what do you want me to do? What do you desire for me to do? 
and he turns around to the Lord and he says, Lord, I'm such a young man. I'm such, I'm a little boy. And here I have been given the charge to rule the whole nation of Israel. What I want to ask you is to give me wisdom, to give me that wisdom, brothers and sisters. He asked the Lord for wisdom. And when he asked the Lord for wisdom, the Lord was so pleased with Solomon that he not only gave him wisdom, but he gave him riches. He gave him every single thing. He gave him the power. He gave him the splendor. He gave him the luxuries. He gave him the complete package because God was pleased by what Solomon asked of the Lord. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we read the book of Proverbs, we read the book of wisdom. These are the writings of Solomon, the man who the Bible in the Old Testament says is the man who had the best wisdom. The Queen of Sheba came to him in order to give that those who listen to him are listening to something which is far more greater than Solomon. Remember, my brothers and sisters, the wisdom of God is in the word of God. Remember, the word of God is Jesus Christ, the fullness of God. The entire wisdom of God, the complete package of God is in Jesus Christ. And when we understand the word of God, now we will be operating in God's wisdom. We are operating as the children of God. Brothers and sisters, how do we become children of God? Many people say, are you a child of God? I'm not so sure a child of God. And when we read John chapter 1 verse 12, we get the answer how you and I become the children of God. John chapter 1 verse number 12. Let us read that to understand who is that child of God? Who is that son of God? Who is that daughter of God? Verse number 12, John chapter 1. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. To all those who believed in Jesus Christ, the Father gave them the power to become children of God. Remember, my brothers and sisters, if you and I are children of God, it's only for one reason, because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Believing in the words of Jesus, believing in his message. If we say that we believe in Jesus, then surely we believe what he said. His words are written in the Bible, right from Matthew to Revelation. When we take the word of God, when we do what the word says, we are proving to God that we are sons, we are his daughters. And so brothers and sisters, spirit is God's wisdom. God's spirit is God's wisdom. And St. Paul was writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, St. Paul was saying that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he was talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he was talking about wisdom being one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let us read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. To what is given through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit so it is the same holy spirit that gives us the wisdom that gives us brothers and sisters the word of god jesus said his word and the holy spirit are one it's not that the holy spirit is one thing the word of god is one thing the holy the heavenly father is one thing they are not. that's what jesus said in john chapter 6 verse 63 he said my word is spirit my word is life and so brothers and sisters when we obey the word of god when we operate according to god's wisdom we are reaching our god-given destination remember john the baptist took the word of god he knew what his assignment was. He lived in the wilderness. He preached the word of God. And in the end, he brought revival to the whole of Israel. He lived among the, uh, the, the tax collectors. He lived among sinners, publicans. He went to Matthew, the tax collector. He went to Zacchaeus. He lived among people who were even, you know, sinful and rejected. He even had the prostitute who was brought to him for stoning. He showed her mercy. And so, my brothers and sisters, the Lord is one 
who is open to every single person. He is the one whose word we need to take. And when we take the word of God and we operate according to the word of God, we are slowly but surely completing that particular assignment, that particular mission that God has called us. Just as John the Baptist finished it, just like Solomon finished it, just like David did that, just like Moses did, and just like Jesus himself came on this earth and finished their mission. In the same way, brothers and sisters, when we take the word of God, when we understand it, when we begin to get a practical working knowledge of the word, what is understanding? Understanding is simply practical working knowledge. For example, if I have this phone with me, this mobile phone. If I do not understand how it works, if I don't have a practical working knowledge of this phone, I don't know how to operate WhatsApp, how to operate the Facebook, how to make a phone call, how to use it as a laptop. I will just take this phone and keep it on my table and use it as paperweight. But the moment I begin to have an understanding, I begin to have a practical working knowledge of my phone. Now I'm going to start operating the phone and take the full use of that. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, when I have a practical working knowledge of the word, when I understand how the word works, I will use the word every single moment of my life. I will use the word and I will receive the victory because as I use the word, the word will direct me to complete my mission. That word will direct me with the wisdom of God to do what God has to do. And so my brothers and sisters, today as we reflect on the, on the gospel passage, just like John the Baptist, just like Jesus, just like all the Old Testament saints, just like St. Paul, St. Peter and all the apostles who did the word of God, you and I are called to receive the wisdom of God, are called to understand the word of God, operate according to the word of God, do what the word says and reach our destination, reach that finishing line, complete the race that we have been put for on this earth and bring glory to God and his kingdom. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for giving us the understanding of your word today. Lord, you have called each one of us, each one without a doubt, to fulfill that purpose, that mission for which you have put us on this earth. Lord, as we understood the word today, you have shown us that your word is the source of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And in your word, is the wisdom. It is through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we receive the wisdom that comes from you. Your word says in James chapter 1 verse 5 that Lord when we ask for wisdom you give it to all those who ask generously ungrudgingly. And so this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever we are in this world, I ask you Lord to give each one of us that wisdom. The wisdom that comes only through your word and through your Holy Spirit. So that Lord by understanding that word, applying that word in our day-to-day -day life, we can complete our mission. we can complete the task, we can complete our assignment here on earth and truly bring glory to your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you, Father, for this wonderful privilege and this understanding in the glorious name of Jesus.